Dzień dobry. I, uh, I learned one Polish word uh, only, uh, which is a pity. Uh. <laughs> oh, okay. It's even two, and it's better. Uh, I, I would like to learn more. I love your country, and I'm glad to uh, be back. Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me again. I've been here two years ago as well, when we had, uh, although in, in other setting at the University of Economics still, we had this discussion uh, when, the post uh, when the enforcement directive was adopted. And at that time, the atmosphere was very different. Um, so you asked me, what is uh, uh, the idea from the Netherlands? But actually, I did not prepare so much for the Netherlands. So um, what I'd like to add to the discussion and, and also pre-discussed with Marek was actually, um, well, linking to the theme, perception versus reality. Um, in my idea, and that's the first um, point I'd like to make, is perceptions, and I think it links in perfectly with the last slides of Catherine, perceptions are reality to a certain extent. These are also facts. And if we ignore perceptions, because we say there are no hard evidence for the, the convictions in these perceptions, then uh, this is for politicians probably a dangerous path. I, I think, in a nutshell, that has been shown. Uh, by, the, by the Brexit campaigns, although, of course, it's much too, too simplistic, I understand that. Um, what I mean to say is that uh, if you would, would suggest that you can only act when there's hard evidence for something, um, this, this um, leaves voters, leaves people on the ground uh, unheard about concerns which may be, may be there and which may have real connections, real uh, 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 value. Um, and um, so yes, I would say if we, if we see the debate versus uh, um, perception versus reality, um, we can say is the debate on social dumping uh, and, and a replacement, etc., uh, unfair treatment um, through posting of workers now driven by hard data, based on real figures? Um, yes, I would say yes. But, as we've heard from Frederick, the problem was that these, these data, these hard figures, were very much incomplete. There was not so many. And this was really the problem. Um, and the other thing, so the question is the debate about posting of workers very much framed by media which do not know the difference between free movement of workers posting and undeclared work, which is also one of the things which was already addressed in the first session. Yes, that's also true. We heard it uh, uh, from Catherine. Um, and I think also in our discussions, and I think uh, um, uh, Catherine uh, just tried to explain the very difficult legal details and, and the, the interface between private international law and posting of workers. Well, this already shows uh, this, it's such clump, complex material that I would really admire your journalists who would be able to, <laughs> to really make this distinction. And then in these short reports they have to make to the public, it's, it's, it's uh, virtually impossible in my view. Um, so I think both are true. Um, the data, yes, the data were incomplete. And what is my impression is very much that we've done from the moment the posting of workers directive was adopted, uh, too little too late in a sense. And then we can say, okay, let's not look back, but let's look forward. But I think we have to look back to some extent in order to understand what went wrong and to try to repair this. And this is actually uh, where I link to, to the last remarks of Frederick, who said, if we know more, we can do more. The problem is only uh, we let so much time uh, skip that we um, have not so much time left to have really nuanced and rational discussion when voters are really pressing and pushing to some extent to do something. And, and that's my impression. Um, what I'd like to, to, to add to my um, few comments is perhaps then also related to history. It has always very much surprised me um, that the European Commission, but also national host states never did more about enforcement measures uh, before 
uh, we got the enforcement directive. And actually, the first uh, uh, elaborate article on posting of workers when the posting directive was just adopted was from Paul Davies in 1997, and he already noticed that the posting of workers directive was more about uh, making promises than about how these promises were to be met. There were no uh, detailed rules whatsoever about monitoring, about enforcement, etc. Um, and this, together with the fact that um, there was resistance towards registration systems. We, the, the Belgium is a perfect example. Now Frederick uses the Limosa data uh, uh, gladly to show at least a little bit, uh, give us some clarity in the cloud. Um, but if uh, it had been for the European Commission, there would not have been a Limosa system because they were against uh, these kind of uh, red tape, administrative obstacles, etc. And this, I think, has really been a wrong uh, attitude because, uh, therefore, you can say both is true. Now, you can see that the, the ones who are promoting services are a bit on the defense, and they suffer from the fact that we have a lack of data. But before we had this turnaround, um, the ones who were advocates of free um, uh, uh, provision of services were very much uh, uh, reluctant in, well, uh, having these registration notification systems. Um, already, I, I did a report before we had the enforcement, uh, uh, the, the discussions about the proposals for enforcement directive. We proposed that it would be better also for reasons of transparency to have a EU-wide registration system, just like we have it for the um, uh, A1 forms, of course. That would, would make it the life much easier <laughs> for the... <laughs> for the ones who do this, this statistical uh, data research. And of course, it's, it's great that we have now from 2014 on this statistical data committee, but we should have had it in the first place. Well, I will not go on repeating, but the strange thing is we also have this partly on the other side, so the migrant workers part. You see there that there are no EU-wide uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, and also partly registration rules. Uh, here you can see that the host states very much have, as we say in the Netherlands, butter on their head, because there were some possibilities here, especially in the migrant workers field, to ask workers to register at municipalities, etc. But the workers just not look at. They just turned a blind eye. Probably, well, this is only speculation. You can, can never prove it. But because host states do not care uh, so much about registration, because that would mean that these workers can also, yeah, when they become unemployed or whatever, not so easily make use of their social welfare system. So it's all very cynical, you might say. And another uh, uh, aspect which is now again uh, popping up is this difference between uh, these migrant workers and posted workers. And here I can perhaps then link to what uh, Leslex said, that we lawyers tend to be naive and, and think that if we put it in a, in a regulation, then it's there. So what was done when the enforcement directive was adopted, you have these recitals which make a clear distinction. and They say posting of workers is not about migrant workers. These are different things. This was the first time actually that this was more or less codified, you could say, what you can gather from case law. But that didn't make this fuzzy distinction go away in practice. That was the problem, and especially not because we do not have good monitoring and enforcement rules. Uh, and I think uh, this is very much uh, behind the fact that media, also after now being used already for 15 years uh, uh, to large amounts of in, uh, influx of, of labor from new member states, if we speak about the host countries, still uh, mingle everything up and still uh, um, blame migrant work or posting work or both when they are actually speaking about undeclared work or at least, uh, well, something in the grey area. Um, well, if we then say, uh, what, what should we do about this distinction between uh, Article 56 and Article 45, uh, I'm a bit hesitant because if you look to the targeted revision, and this will be my last remark before you can open discussion. Um, uh, you can see that actually um, it's very interesting that you have some equal treatment 
proposals in there, and you have this uh, uh, time limit in there. And the eco-treatment things, you could say, relate both to Article 45, and they relate to, uh, well, the social part. Whereas the legal base was only service provision. And this has always been an uneasy fit with the three goals in the Posting of Workers Directive. On the one hand, you have this only legal base, services, and on the other hand, you have protection of workers and prevention of, we can say, social dumping, unfair competition. So there were three elements, but the legal base only reflects more or less one of them. Um, and here you see, again, we can put that in, in the, uh, 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 the legal provisions, but the, the, the elements behind it do not go away. So um, I would say um, that there are indeed problems with the time limit because it's, it's the link with private international law makes it very difficult to, uh, well, to still uh, guarantee that this long-term posted worker would that, who, who would then be treated fully equally as far as labor law provisions are concerned with uh, uh, migrant workers and national workers would still be in the, the frame of posting of workers. And also, you can wonder whether, because posted workers is of course, uh, there is a division between the high wage, high wage posting and low wage, high wage posting, you can wonder whether this time limit really uh, is always fitting to the longer term postings often in, for instance, uh, ICT uh, sector, etc. cetera. Um, but in my view, um, it is only making things also more complex. And I heard here in the, in the first round that one of the problems is also that it's so complex. And if you can one, if you can say one thing in favor of uh, equal treatment and of a clear time limit, it is that it seems to make it uh, less complex. But then, of course, the, the details must also fit, because otherwise it, uh, it will be a uh, uh, challenge, for instance, for the Court of Justice, and everything starts again. So in my idea, it is better to, if you, make, if you, if you uh, have this cut of a certain time limit, then not make it more difficult than it already is and say, okay, then um, workers should be from, let's say, one year, two year on, fully seen as Article 45 uh, workers. Because in a way you can say, if you are already so long on the labor, on the market, uh, within the territory of a host state, you are more or less in the labor market integrated of the host state. And if it comes then to the equal treatment provisions, just a few last words, what you see very interesting is in the posting of workers directives, you have three different types of posting combined. And this already was also in, the, in 1997 addressed by Paul Davis, who said that it, would not, that it seems not to be a very good idea to lump all these three together because they are not uh, very much the same. There's a difference between this construction sector posting, which was the archetype, and uh, uh, temp agency posting and intra-corporate transferee posting. In the last uh, two modes, there is a very fine line or blurring, uh, these lines are actually blurred, between uh, accessing the labor market and providing a service because the service of temp agencies is matching supply and demand on the labor market to a certain extent. That's their main service. So that's, uh, that's uh, well, it's very much on or across the border of, of uh, um, migrant work, which is about access to the labor market. Um, so the interesting thing is that now the, the proposals say temp agency workers should be treated equally, and there's also relation then with the agency work directive, and also this other category of ICT work should be treated equally. And uh, I think this shows that there is a distinction between the three and that it's more difficult to uh, defend that uh, temp agency workers and ICT workers should not be treated fully equally than the other category perhaps. Um, and one last thing then about the ICT, yes. It's all. There the, the European Commission may have thought, and I think they did, 
um, uh, about the, you have also a directive for now, since 2014, for ICT, so intracorporate intra -corporate transfers from third countries. And this again is in another, from a legal perspective, another context, because it's not, the legal base is not free movement of services. But of course, it's very much the same. The only difference is that it's from third countries and not from within the EU. And what you see there is that the conditions are that these workers are treated equally. They even have access to, uh, to immediately from day one, social security uh, regulation in the state where they are uh, transferred to. Um, and there's a time limit, very interesting, differently for high-skilled workers and for low-skilled workers. So wouldn't it be strange then, uh, as a last perhaps provocative remark, to say to a posted worker from within the EU, ICT worker, an intra-corporate transferee, that he or she is not treated uh, uh, equally, whereas a third country national would be. So I think we cannot escape uh, the fact that at the end of the day it's all labor mobility, and although we as lawyers have nicely put it in different categories, it's still <laughs> for the public, and also very much I think for people who are on the ground, uh, busy with it, employers and employees alike, more or less the same. Thank you.